Good morning. It's good to be with you on this Easter sunrise service morning. Uh, we are at a different location. We can't be together, uh, but that's going to happen again soon. We're in a cemetery. We're in a place where there are tombs all around us. And it really is somewhat reminiscent of that first resurrection morning. And uh, I want us to be encouraged this morning. I want us to look at a location like this and not just have uh, the thoughts of grief and sorrow and memories that come to our mind and the people that we love. But I want us to look at a place like this and realize, you know what, this, this is a location, this is a scene of the greatest victory that ever happened in the history of mankind. You know that? I want us to look at a cemetery through a different lens. When we see, when we see all these tombs, we see the reality that Jesus Christ has risen from the dead. He has risen, folks. That's right, I thought I heard you. He has risen indeed. You know, that is our greatest joy. That's our greatest celebration. And so this morning, we're gonna, we're gonna celebrate that. Um, I wanna take some time this morning and just look at uh, some scriptures. Kind of a harmony of scriptures from the Gospels, kind of giving us a flow as to what happened that morning. We pick it up in Matthew chapter 28, verse one. Now after the Sabbath, towards the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to the tomb. Mark tells us that Mary, the mother of James and Salome, they brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. So these and other ladies, they come to the tomb and their desire and their goal is to anoint the body of Jesus. Now his body has already been anointed, prepared for burial. They're coming to anoint his body on the external, on the external side of that wrapping and all of that. They're coming to, uh, to honor him, uh, to be with him one more time, um, to worship him. It, it, it's kind of like a sense of maybe bringing flowers uh, and to honor him. And so Mary Magdalene, I want to kind of focus on her this morning. We remember she was the one who had seven demons cast out of her. She was demon possessed. Uh, her life was in absolute chaos and turmoil before she met Christ. And this morning's going to change her life again. And I want us to see that. Matthew tells us in chapter 28, verse 2, there was a great earthquake. Uh, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. And so, as, as uh, Mark tells us in chapter 16, early on that first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They were saying to one another, who is gonna roll the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? Who's gonna move that stone? We've got, we've got the ointment. They didn't have the answer to that question. They were hoping upon hope that there would be a solution somehow. Maybe the guards would help them, uh, someone else. Now John picks it up and tells us this. See, see what happens is the ladies are, they start early that morning. They start on their way. Mary Magdalene is with the ladies. Somewhere along the way, it seems like Mary Magdalene takes off and she goes ahead of all the ladies. And she arrives at the tomb first by herself. John 20 picks it up in verse one. On that first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark. So she's really hurried. And she saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. That's what she encountered when she got to the tomb. The stone was rolled away. Verse two, John tells us, and she ran. And she ran and she went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, that's John. And she said to him, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they've laid him. So her first response in her heart is, is she's crushed. She saw that stone rolled away. Instead of going in, instead of looking in, she assumed that someone had taken the body of Jesus, had stolen the body of Jesus. She didn't know where they took it. And so she's crushed. Mark tells us the other ladies arrive after her, verse five, and they entered the tomb and they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe and they, they were alarmed. And he said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. Matthew adds this, he has risen just as he said. The angel communicates that Jesus has risen just as he said he was gonna do. 
in accordance and in harmony with the with the word of God. He's not here anymore. There has there has been a victory that has been won. He his body wasn't stolen. He's risen from the dead. And so the angel says, Mark 7, go tell his disciples and Peter that he's going before you to Galilee. And there you will see him just as he told you. And they, and they went out and they fled, they fled from the tomb for trembling and astonishment had seized them. And, and they said nothing to anyone for they were afraid. I think initially there was a response of just being overwhelmed. Yes, even, af even afraid of having this encounter with, with this angelic being. Matthew tells us this, they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and they ran to tell his disciples. I don't think there's a contradiction here. I think their initial response was one of, of, of just, just fear and being overwhelmed. And they either, they either didn't go to their disciples right away, but it appears they did. But you gotta remember, Mary Magdalene has already arrived and she's told them that someone has taken the body of Jesus Christ. So that, that's already affected the mood of the disciples that morning. And so when they arrive, they step into that mood, into that tone. And maybe for a time they lose their voice and, and, uh, and the fear and, and everything that happened overwhelms them. But they find their voice and with joy and with exuberance they share, he's risen. And, and then we're told, and then we're told here in verse 11 of Luke, but these words seemed to them, to the apostles, an idle tale and they did not believe them. Their response was one of unbelief but not totally. John 20, and Peter went out with the other disciple, that's John, and they went towards the tomb and both of them were running together. And the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. Running for all this, running through the cemetery, running towards the tomb. And so, John stooped to look in, but he saw the linen, oh, I'm sorry, both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter, and he reached the tomb first, and stooping to look in, he saw the linen clothes lying there, but he, he didn't go in. And then Simon Peter came, following him, and he went into the tomb, and he saw the linen clothes lying there, and the face cloth which had been on Jesus' face, not lying with the linen clothes, but folded up in a place by itself. And then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first, that's John, also went in. And he saw and he believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. And the disciples went back to their homes. Luke tells us, and Peter went home marveling at what had happened. John looked into that tomb. And, and the immediate response of his heart, I tell you, was one of belief. He believed in that moment that Jesus was alive, that he had risen from the dead. He couldn't put all the pieces together, the puzzle together from scripture. He, he didn't have all the answers yet, but he immediately believed that Jesus was alive. Now, where's Mary Magdalene in all this? Mary got there to the tomb before the other ladies. She left before they got there. She goes back to the disciples. Someone's taken his body. The other ladies come back, maybe in groups, or we don't know. They come back. They ultimately tell the disciples he's risen from the dead. Only Peter and John run back. Mary Magdalene, it appears, also came back. Not with them, but followed them. They go into the tomb, and they look, and they see Jesus. They don't see him. They see his empty tomb, and they're told that he is risen. Or they're not told he's risen. They believe in faith, and, and they leave, and they go home. And then Mary and Magdalene is still there. Verse 11 of John chapter 20, Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she stood, she stooped to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white, sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. And they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, they have taken away my Lord and I do not know where they have laid him. So she's, she's crushed. She, she still not, has not encountered the realization that Jesus Christ is alive. And having said this, she turned around and she saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? And whom are you seeking? And supposing him to be the gardener of 
uh, a tender of the garden, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me, where have you laid him, and I will take him away. She's still in this mindset that someone has taken the body of Jesus Christ. And Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned and said to him in Ar Aramaic, Rabboni, which in English is teacher. And Jesus said to her, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene went and she announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them everything. Her life has changed. She has encountered Jesus Christ. I want to pick up what Paul says about, about this day, this morning, this significance. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul says, I want to remind you, I want to remind you, brothers and sisters, I want to remind all of you of the gospel, of the gospel that I have been preaching to you, which you, which you have received and in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word I preach to you, unless, unless you believed in vain, Paul's saying a transformed life is fruit and evidence of that salvation. We're not saved by works, but it is the evidence of the power of God in our life. He writes in verse 3, For I delivered to you of, here's the most important thing in my ministry, he says, of first importance, what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Then he says, if Jesus, if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. What a terrible thing. But he says, you know what? That's not the case. That's why we're here this morning. That's why we celebrate today. Verse 20 says, Paul says this, in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. The gospel, it's rooted in power. It's rooted in resurrection. What happened at a cemetery, at a tomb, almost 2,000 years ago, is the, is the highest definition of what power is all about. Jesus broke the power of sin and of death. He is the first. We enjoy the riches of the fruit of that work throughout our life as a child of God and into eternity through forever and ever and ever. I want to talk about that, that principle of first fruits in just a moment. I'm going to go back to the church, I'm going to gather together, and we'll continue this, this celebration this morning. Hello, ever, hello everybody. Uh, we're back at the church. We had a wonderful time together, and it's really strange, uh, unusual on this on this Easter celebration day. Uh, no one's here at the church. Uh, it's empty, um, but you know what's true? The grave is empty too. Uh, the grave of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He is risen, and that's what we're celebrating today. So I want to pick up from where we were at this morning. We're in First Corinthians chapter 15, and. Um, we see this, in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. That is a fact of history, and it is the focal point of all Christianity. So we're excited to, to proclaim it and to share it with you this morning. It says here also, as he continues, it is the first fruits. He is the first fruits of all those who have fallen asleep. What he did there, uh, no one else has done or will ever do to lay down his life freely and to take it up of his own will, his own volition, his own power. And that's what Jesus Christ did. He did it because of his love for us. And so we're celebrating that today. And what he did there continues to have impact to all of us, all of humanity, from the moment of the cross backwards to the beginning of history, all the way forward to the time when history ends. And so we set this up with this concept of the first fruits. He is the first and uh, what he did impacts us for all eternity. I wanted just to look at, uh, this concept is really in the Old Testament significantly. I want to look at one verse only to give us an idea of what this means in the concept of first fruits. Deuteronomy chapter 26 reminds us, tells us, Behold, now I bring the, the first of the fruit of the ground, which you, O Lord, have given me. 
And then God says to, to the to worshiper, and you shall set it down before the Lord your God and worship before the Lord your God. The concept of first fruit is simply this. Everything that we own comes from God. When God blessed his people, uh, they were to bring those the very first of the crop, uh, the best of the crop, they were to bring it first to the Lord. They were to bring it to him in worship. And that also signified, that also signaled that uh, this this act of worship was to be carried out in, in perpetuity, um, consistently through the walk of their life, in adoration to the Lord and thanksgiving to the Lord. Uh, offerings of, of first fruit, festivals of first fruit. It was a concept of, uh, of acknowledging the Lord first in everything and giving him our very best. We are in 1 Corinthians 15. And in the verses that we're finishing with, it's just a reminder to us of the reality of, of this first fruit and how Christ is that for us. There are two models of first fruit in these verses, and I want to look at both of them. Let's begin with the first one. In verse 21, we read these words, For as by a man came death. The first example of first fruit is, is through Adam. It takes us back to Genesis 3. Adam was created first before Eve. God gave Adam instructions, gave him a mission. Eve was created. Then they spent time together. Then there came a moment in time when they stood before the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And God says, you can eat of any tree in the garden except that one. And Eve made a choice to eat of, of the fruit of that tree. Adam followed. But Adam was there the whole time. He didn't say anything. He didn't forbid her. He didn't say no. He sat there in silence. And Eve made that choice, and then so did Adam. And so Adam is, is the head of the human race as the firstborn, the first created. He is representative of all human race. And so what he did there has consequence. In Genesis 3, if we were to go back to that passage, we read these words. God says to Adam, you will return to the ground. For out of it you were taken for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. It is a consequence of Adam's sin, not only to Adam specifically, but to all of humanity. The whole human race would suffer this consequence because of the sin of Adam. The result of that, the fruit of that, of Adam's, Adam's choice and Adam's sin, we see in verse 22 of this passage. For as in Adam all die, everywhere we go we encounter death, uh, we are all infected by the consequence of Adam's choice. We're all infected by this disease called death. You know, we have COVID. It's affecting us all. We have this pandemic that's affecting this whole world. And we are in the very middle of it. We're having to stay home, can't go out, um, all these things. And, and sin is the same way. We're infected by the reality, the consequence of sin. Romans chapter 5, Paul writes these words. Just as sin came into the world... Through one man, that's Adam, and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all have sinned. You know, the reality of COVID is this. Just being who we are, we can be carriers. We don't even have to touch people. Now they're telling us if we simply breathe, our breath can, can infect someone else. You know, sin is, is that way and so much more. It has affected all of us. With COVID, you don't know... Um, who has it and who doesn't. You don't even know if you have it yourself until the symptoms appear later. I can be a carrier and not even know it initially. With sin, we're all infected. Everyone we bump into is, is infected by sin. In, in our home right now, the person next to you is infected by this disease, this pandemic called sin. I am infected by this pandemic, this disease called sin. That's the reality. Hebrews tells us this, and so as a result, it's appointed uh, unto man to die once, every man, woman, and child. And after that comes the judgment. And death is appointed for us all, and that's because of the choice of Adam, the sin of Adam, the consequence, the curse that God brought down upon mankind because of sin, its entrance into our world. Like I said, there's two models here of first fruit. Adam is that first one. Adam shows us our need, the need of all humanity. We have a need we can't meet. We have a disease we cannot heal. We have a condition that there's nothing we can do about it. And, and so Jesus comes into the picture on this Easter Sunday, and we encounter him in, uh, again here in this passage. Verses 3 and 4, we see that Christ died for our sins. 
In accordance with the scripture, he was buried and raised on the third day. He died for our sins. He was our first fruit. He did what we couldn't do. Uh, he laid down his life and took it up again. And uh, within the resurrection is, is the very power of God, the power that's available to us. The ramifications, the implications of that, well, that's what, that's what this message is all about. That's what Easter is all about. That's what the gospel is all about. He died in our place. He stood in our place so that we could have life. So let's look at some of those things. Uh, the reality is this, in verse 21 of this passage, by one, my, by one man, a man, Christ, has come the resurrection of the dead. Through his resurrection, he has made possible the resurrection of all humanity. Every man, every woman, every child. One man, one God, but one act for all time has affected us all, saved and unsaved, by him going to the cross and rising in victory. John chapter 5 gives us uh, these words, which are really important here. He says, An hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out. And I just think about uh, our time together at the cemetery. I think about all the cemeteries of the world, all the graves of the world. There's a time coming. There's a moment in time coming when all the graves will be emptied. The sea will be emptied. The land will be emptied. The earth and the sea will give up the dead. And because of what Jesus Christ did at the cross, because of his victory over death, he will raise all humanity to life. That is a reality of Scripture. Um, but he continues in this verse, and he makes two specific distinctions. He says, those who have done good will be raised to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. There's two resurrections that are going to take place. One is a resurrection to Jesus Christ, to life, and one is a resurrection to judgment or to wrath. He says, those who have done good and those who have done evil. We need to be careful here to understand that John or no one else in Scripture is telling us that we're saved by works. Uh, that's not what he's teaching here, and that's not what is taught in the Scriptures. What he is teaching and what he is revealing is that the works of our life ultimately reveal our heart. Uh, it ultimately reveals our relationship with Christ. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 just remind us, it is by grace that we've been saved. It is through faith. It's not of our own doing. It is, in, in, in fact, it's the gift of God, not a result of works so that none of us can boast. Uh, God's work in our life, it, our salvation is, is of God. It is by his grace. It is his salvation. It is his faith. None of that is of our own doing. It is God that accomplished that in our life. And so, you know, this morning we just say, as we stand here together, this message and our proclamation as a child of God is Christ. It's all about him. And so, verse 22 of chapter 15, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. Now, there's a distinction here. In this verse prior to that, the verses prior to that, he, we're all going to be uh, resurrected. We're all going to live for eternity. But this life here in verse 22 is different than just living for eternity. This life is found in Christ here, verse 22. It is in Christ that all will be made alive. He, he continues that distinction and he shows uh, how important this is in verse 23. Who's going to experience his life? Those who belong to Christ. There is the life that the Lord is going to give to, to every human being. He's going to raise us all from the dead. We are going, either going to be separated from the Lord or we're going to be with the Lord, but we're all going to be alive. This life, in these two verses, is a life that is different than just that existence. It is a life that is found in Christ. It is life in Christ through salvation. And Jesus tells us here that those who belong to him are going to have an abundant life. The very presence of God, the peace of God, the joy of God, the relationship that lasts for all eternity. Those who have this relationship will be with the Lord forever. Those who are simply living but do not have this relationship will be separated from God under the wrath and judgment of God. They will be alive, but they will be enduring the wrath of God for all eternity. And so, I don't know, our response, our response, what could possibly be our response but just gratitude? 
First Peter four, or First Peter one three. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We have life in Christ. I trust that that's your reality this morning. There's a sequence here, the first fruits. What is the fruit of the work that Jesus Christ did on the cross? It's not that we just all rise. It's that we have life in Christ if we belong to him. Let's look at that fruit a little bit here in this passage. There is an order. There is a sequence to life in Christ. Verse 23, we see that. But each in his own order, it starts with Christ, each in his own order. The first part of that order is Christ. There is a sequence that follows of this life, and it begins, it ends, it starts, and it lasts for all eternity. Its source is Jesus Christ. He is our life. And from him come the fruits of eternal life, come the fruits of that relationship. So where it begins is simply this. Do you know Jesus Christ is your Savior? Have you accepted him as your Lord? Do you have life in Christ? Have your sins been forgiven? The second part of that sequence is this. It's found in verse 23 as we continue that. Then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. There are those who belong to Christ. And what, and what Jesus is going to do, he started his work at the cross. He laid down his life. He took it up again. He rose in victory. There's a day coming when he's going to gather the family of God together. That's the second piece here. All those who belong to him are going to be gathered together at his coming. There's a number of different elements here in this equation, and we can't go into detail. But suffice it to say here that every genuine believer who is alive today in the, in the church age is going to be lifted up to be with the Lord. There is a rapture coming someday. We're going to be lifted up to be with the Lord. Those who have already uh, passed away in Jesus Christ are going to be lifted up to be with the Lord in, in body and in soul. Those who have walked through the tribulation, those who have become martyrs or who have survived and maintained their testimony for Christ, they're going to be gathered together here. All of the Old Testament believers, the Old Testament saints are going to be gathered together. Everyone who has ever received Christ, who has ever put their faith in, in Christ alone, in God alone, is going to be gathered together, will be a part of this family. Then there is an end coming, an end which also is a part of the fruit of the work of Christ that was began at the cross, finished at his resurrection, is going to be accomplished here in the end. What are those pieces? Well, verse 24 tells us this. The Lord is going to deliver uh, a kingdom to his Father, an eternal kingdom. Then comes the end. When he, when Christ, delivers the kingdom to God the Father, the Lord is going, to, is going to come at the end of the tribulation. He's going to rule and reign during the millennial kingdom. And then he's going to deliver that to his father. But first, something significant must happen. And it will be an eternal kingdom where he will rule and reign with his father. In verse 24, as we continue, we see this. But first, he must destroy all evil. So he says, after destroying every rule and every authority and power... He must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. You see, Jesus Christ defeated death at the cross. It's done. It is de death is defeated. However, it has not been destroyed. It is at the end of the millennial kingdom when the Lord will destroy death, when death and, and sin and sinners will be cast into the lake of fire. And... and Humanity will never experience death ever again. Those who are under the wrath of God will, will live a, 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 an eternal death under the wrath of God. Those who are in Jesus Christ will live in life everlasting, abundant life. Neither will die a physical death ever again. We will live for all eternity. Death will have been destroyed. There is a day coming when he will destroy death. It will no longer be the experience of humanity. And so Easter really is a celebration. It's a celebration of life. It is, a, it is a celebration of victory. What Jesus Christ accomplished at the cross was victory. Verse 57 of this passage that we're in, we move down to verse 57. There's a lot of content we could look at here. We're just going to look at a few more pieces. 
Paul writes these words, and so thanks. Lord, we thank you. God, we thank you. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. When I consider what Jesus did for me, I'm so grateful. I'm so thankful. My life is, is forever changed because of the love of Christ. If you are a child of God this morning, that is your reality. He has, he has changed your life forever. Hebrews 12, we're working through, we're working through a scripture memory as a church. This is a new verse where we were adding to our, to our memory as a church here in April and May and June. Hebrews 12, 28 reminds us that we are to be grateful. Let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. That is the result. That's the fruit. That's the impact of the work of Christ at the cross and when he rose from the dead. Um, and so there is worship that, that uh, is the reality of every believer. There is a gratefulness that flows from our heart. How can, we, how can we give thanks enough? How can we convey in our words what Jesus Christ means to us? We try, and we put it into song, and we put it into music. But that's a worshipful heart. And then the verse ends and says these words as well. So let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. You know, the result is, is worship, and the result is servants, service to the Lord. Uh, we offer ourselves. Romans 12, 1 or 2 basically tells us that we are a living sacrifice. We offer ourselves to the Lord. That's what this is all about. And so Easter, Easter is victory. Easter is celebration. And Easter, ultimately, the story of the resurrection of Christ, the reality of the resurrection of Christ, it really is about change. It's about life change. Uh, he came to change our lives, to use our lives to be a light to others, to see the grace of God and the love of God. That's why he came, uh, to change lives. And, and through our lives, our testimony, to bring honor and glory and praise back to him. And so here in the last verse of this passage in 1 Corinthians 15, we pick up this last, this last element, this last fruit, this last result of the work of Christ in our life. Verse 58 Therefore, my beloved brothers, you know, the message of the resurrection, it changes us. And it changes us because we are changed by the very love of Christ. You know, I stand here and I can just say with an with a absolute certainty and a, and a joy, the Lord loves you. And he loves me. And he puts up with me because I am, and I, because I am a work of his hands, the work of his spirit. My life has been changed because I placed my faith and my trust in Jesus Christ as my Savior. I know He loves me. I know He loves you for God so loved the world that He gave His only Son. He loves you this morning. It doesn't matter what your experience is. It doesn't matter what your failures are. It doesn't matter what your questions about God are. He loves you and wants you to know that He is sufficient for your life. And He is able to bring into your life the meaning that the world cannot offer and cannot provide and cannot, cannot fulfill. Only Jesus Christ can do that in salvation. We are so loved this morning. That is the message of Easter. He continues in this verse and he says this. He says, to every child of God, we are to be steadfast. We are to be immovable, always, always abounding in the work of the Lord. We are changed because he loves us. We are changed by his calling in our life. When we receive Jesus Christ as Savior, we receive his mission. We receive his call. We are to serve him. We're to do his work. Um, I am a pastor. There's nothing special about being a pastor. But it is a significant call by God upon my life. For that reason, it is special. God has elevated that. But you know what? I'm also a father. I'm also a husband. That is a role. I am to do I'm to do God's work in those roles. You're at home, you're a brother, you're a sister, you're a grandparent. Whatever it is that defines you, God has given you a, 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 a vocation in your life. He's given you a, different roles in your life. As a child of God, I'm to use those, those roles as opportunities to show people the difference that Christ is making in my life. I'm to let the Lord do his work in my life and in my heart so that it just comes out of it comes out of every fiber of my body. and Everything that I do, I'm doing it for Christ. I'm doing it for his glory. I'm doing it for his honor. I'm doing it to serve his people, to serve my family while we're home, to serve his church, and to serve those who need Christ so desperately, like Jesus served Judas. He served him to the end, even though Judas rejected. 
We are, to, we are to be servants of the Lord and do his work. That is the fruit, the result of, of his resurrection. Because you and I can only do that with the love that is biblical because he's poured that into our life. If you and I, when we live that way, when we treat others with his love, when we share his truth, right, how we live our life, we are doing the, the work that shows the power of the Spirit of God. And that leads us to the last piece of this verse. Because we know that in the Lord, our labor is not in vain. We are changed because he loves us, and we are changed because he has called us. He has given us a mission. He's given us a purpose, and we're changed because he enables us. He is the power in our life. I could never, I could never do, I could never be what God wants me to be unless I first yielded to him and let him become the power in my life. I can't do it on my own. Because of that disease of Adam, because of his sin infecting me, that still is a part of my body. It's a part of my thinking. It's a part of everything I do. And when Jesus saves me, he overcomes that power. He throws out the power of Satan. He overcomes the bondage that Satan had on my life, the claim that Satan had on my life. He throws out that kingmaker and he becomes the king of my throne. He becomes the king of my heart. His spirit comes to live in my life and now becomes the power of my life. I cannot lose my salvation. I am empowered to walk with the Lord. Because of that sin disease, I still make mistakes. I still sin. I still need the Lord's help. But on this day of Easter celebration, there is hope for me, and there is hope for you because God lives in my heart. And he is the power that enables me to love others, to love myself the way I should so that I can love others the way he wants me to, to to show grace and to show mercy to others. It is all about Christ. He says in John 11, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. If I die physically, that's not the end. I'm going to live forever, either with the Lord or apart from the Lord. As a child of God, I'm going to be with the Lord forever. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. I may die physically, but I will never die spiritually. And he will raise my physical body to a new body to be like his resurrection body. So this teaches that there is a certainty in that relationship I have with Christ. And then he simply asks here this, this so important question. He says, do you believe this? Do you believe everything that Paul has talked about this morning? You know, when the, when the woman and the disciples came to that tomb that, uh, that morning, this morning, almost 2,000 years ago. When they came and they were looking, when the disciples and Peter and John saw that empty tomb, they believed. When Mary Magdalene finally encountered Christ, she believed and saw with her eyes a resurrected Savior. All of those disciples, those ladies, those women, and the church that would grow out of that was the fruit of faith, of belief in the resurrected Savior. Do you believe this? Do you believe? Do you believe? It changed them forever. They were transformed. Is that your experience today? Romans 10, 9, Paul just makes uh, very clear here. If we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. You know, my prayer is that God will move your heart uh, to have faith in the Lord, that he'll transform your life to live for him, He's called us to this moment, and he challenges us right here, right now, wherever you're listening from. He challenges you by presenting this opportunity before you. Have you confessed with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord? Have you confessed from your heart that he is Savior, that he is the only one who can save you from your sins? Have you confessed from your life that there is only one way, one truth, one life is found in Jesus Christ? Have you confessed that you need a Savior? Have you confessed the disease and the sin of your life and laid before the Lord this plea, Lord, I need you. I need you as my Savior. I need you to wash me, to cleanse me, to do in my life what I can't do, can't do in myself. I need you to heal me of this disease. I need you and I ask of you and I, and I implore you to give me a relationship that is found by faith in Christ, a relationship that is found through salvation. I ask you to call upon Jesus Christ. 
It says here, if you believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is victorious, that He rose from the dead, then you are saved. When He rose from the dead, He, he won the victory over sin, over the disease that we all face, over death. He won the victory. And He calls you to faith. He calls you to lay your life before Him and say, Lord, I need you. Lord, I'm willing to, to follow you. I'm willing to follow after you. God, I want to be yours. I want, I want you to mark my life. I want you to have my life. I want you to change my life. We're going to pray here in just a moment. If you've not made that decision, I would encourage you, just in the quietness of where you're at, to lay your heart before the Lord and say, Lord, this is what I want. This is where I'm at. This is my need. If you're a child of God, then I, I would ask that you would just refresh that commitment of, if I belong to the Lord, and I know that, then the fruit of that is my life is conformed to Christ. I am following the Lord. I am obeying the Lord. My life resembles Christ and how I live. Let's bow our heads in prayer. While I'm praying, I just put this up here as well. I invite you, if you want to talk to us, uh, we are here that you can do that. You can, you can go to these locations and do that. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Let's talk to the Lord. Lord, this morning we just we lay before you every heart. I lay before you my heart. Lord, keep my heart tender, passionate for Christ, tender for you, passionate about the gospel, the good news. For every believer who is listening this morning, Lord, fill our hearts with praise and worship. Fill our hearts with a, a, a will that is yielded to you, a will that says, Lord, conform me to Christ, shape my life so that I become more like Christ. Lord, remove the things in my life that are a barrier to this growth. God, instead, pour the passion of your love into my life that I might love you like that. Lord, if there's one this morning who has never received Christ, that doesn't have the peace and the certainty of where they stand in Jesus Christ, right now, in this moment, would they confess with their mouth uh, that Jesus Christ is Lord? Would they confess that there is a Savior that they need? Would they look to Christ in eyes of faith and understand and realize that he is the only one who loves them enough to have taken their place on the cross, to stand between them and his Father and received God's wrath that, that we all deserved. And so, Lord, they can come to you and receive forgiveness and be made holy in Christ and be made complete in Christ. And the wall and the barrier that stood between Adam and God and stands between every human being and God is broken down when we come by faith to the cross. Lord, I pray that they would uh, believe that Jesus Christ is Lord and give their life to you this morning. Find forgiveness and cleansing that they would lay before you a desire to follow after you and say, Lord, I am here right now. Lord, change my life. I am willing to be used of you. We pray that work of the Lord in each heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Happy Easter. He is risen.